Hello, hello. My name is Erin Shaw. I am a visual artist. At this point in my life, I am primarily a visual artist only um, and engaging in some more community-based projects. Uh, and it's a little bit about where I'm kind of uh, putting my effort at this point. Um, I do, however, come to you with a lot, a lifetime of education experience. So my experience within the educational systems, kind of the gamut from, um, I've worked in, a, I feel like just about every context uh, that kids go to school in. So private schools, Christian schools, inner city Title I schools, more recently higher education, but right now I'm not teaching in any, um, any formal way at all. So because I'm an artist, um, I'm not really a statistician, but I do have a lot of data for you. Um, I am really more interested in the ideas, and I think that um, I'm so excited to get to talk about the beautiful because I talk about beauty all the time, and it feels like a, um, a difficult conversation for us sometimes uh, to sort of understand as Westerners and maybe also as believers why beauty matters why it's important, why it's necessary, what we are uh, letting go of when we do not pay attention to it. So I want to give you just one sort of small piece of my personal philosophy about beauty, and I think it'll just help us a little bit, and then I'll go into um, some data. I'm going to come at my part of this from education, um, because I think that education is the easiest inroad to our kids in our city, uh, especially in the, uh, the realm of art. So... Um, Beauty is, I believe, a manifestation. It is a fruit. It is something that captures our human uh, sensibilities. And it, when we see beauty, what it, what it does is it causes us to pay attention and it stops us. And it is a manifestation that there is something that is greater, truer, better, deeper there. And, and I believe that that's why beauty exists. Beauty, to me, is not our end goal, but it is a manifestation of something good and right and true. So that is true in that side, but the, the converse of that is also true. So where there's a lack of beauty, I believe that there's a lack of truth and goodness and depth, and that is why it's important. And when we neglect beauty as a part of the conversation, it is difficult for us because we think it's superfluous and it's unnecessary, but it is actually vital. And it is actually an incredible indicator of well-being. So it's, it's important for us to, to be aware of that. I want to start with this one quote, and then I'll get into a few little stats for you. Um, a guy named Gregory Wolf wrote a book called Beauty Will Save the World. And I love that book. And he says, unless we contribute to the renewal of culture by participating in the life of art in our time, we will find that the barbarians have entered by gates that we ourselves have torn down. So a few stats. I know that we all kind of implicitly understand that art education is important, um, that our kids having accessibility and engagement with the arts is important, but I just, the National Endowment for the Arts has the most amazing adept researchers, and they do research around all kinds of things, every stat you want about art and its effects. And these are just a few, I think, statistics that are, are important as we start to talk a little bit about how are our children in regards to beauty in our city. Um, students with high arts participation and low socioeconomic status have a 4% dropout rate. That is five times lower than their low socioeconomic peers. Students who have four years of arts and music classes average 100 points better on their SAT than students who take one half a year or less. Low income students who are highly engaged in arts are twice as likely to graduate college as their peers with no arts education. 72% of business leaders say that creativity is the number one skill they're looking for when hiring. So those are just a few statistics that I think are you know, compelling. There's tons of it out there. I'm not a stat statistician, but I do know that we like data. Um, so let's turn our attention to Oklahoma. The question posed to us as panelists was, how are, how are the children uh, of the city doing in your area? So probably um, when I talk about this, I'm going to talk about uh, accessibility to art, engagement with art, and the creation of art. And 
um, knowing that that is a good indicator uh, of well-being. So the easiest place for us to look when we talk about our kids, because we have great institutions available, we have galleries, we have museums, but likely most of our kids are not going to encounter those types of places, but they do go to school. And so we know that in the 2016-2017 year, the Oklahoma City Public School lost 44 full-time uh, art positions. Um, I, I wanna let you know that all of your data, that all, everything I'm reading here, you have accessible in the resources tab uh, on, the, on your iPad. So in many of those cases, those teachers, even though we lost 44 teachers, that does not mean that it was just 44 schools that were affected. Many of those teachers were teaching at multiple schools. And so um, a, a lot of our kids were affected by that. I'm gonna break it down for you a little bit. I'm only talking about elementary schools. So in 57 Oklahoma City public school elementary schools, 19 of those schools lost their general music uh, program this year. Uh, zero music they lost this year. 24 of those schools lost their visual arts program. And even though those, um, there may still be schools that have that kind of instruction going on, it could be uh, very, very minimal. It could be 30 minutes a week. So when we talk about actual um, students, that's 5,500 of our kids that have no music instruction at all. Um, 9,000 of our kids who have no visual art. And there are five schools within, uh, elementary schools within our district that have zero anything, anything. PE is protected by state law, so when those budget cuts happen, the principals know that they cannot touch the PE place, which is great, kids need PE also. Um, so when asked how are the kids in our city, um, in, I'm sorry, that's how are the children, um, it, I, I think it could definitely be worse, but it's not great. And, you know, when, when you look at the, the fact that it's not great, there are so many opportunities. So I want to tell you the way that it does work within our district. For schools that don't have um, actual teachers, then typically what happens is there are after-school programs, and there are lots of great after-school programs, but there is not a system-wide process for after-school programs because it's not district money that funds it. Um, then what happens is those programs are developed through relationships basically. So you're still dealing with some level of privilege because it's going to be families that either value it or know people or know how to make things happen that they can organize and assemble um, after school programs and bring them in to serve the kids. And so um, you're still dealing with a lot of kids that have actually absolutely no access whatsoever. Um, the other thing that we were kind of tasked with was what is going on in the city? Uh, that Where are the bright spots? Um, and so there's just a couple things that I, I wanted to highlight to you and let you guys know about. You have all of this information. There's people's names and links and info to what uh, is going on. Uh, and if I were having a conversation about how do we make accessibility to the arts uh, better for our children, I would want every person on this list, I would want them at the table. Because there are people that have worked tirelessly in our city to advocate for kids, advocate for art education, advocate for something that uh, many people will see as kind of fluff, you know, it's the first thing that goes. So there's a program called um, El Sistema, which is a, an after school program that serves um, disadvantaged public school children and it is, um, they work to create ensemble based music and they do an amazing, incredible job with uh, you can go to their website and they have they have uh, amassed data, they have stories, they have stats of incredible, incredible reach and effect in children's lives. Um, Robin Hilger, uh, I would want her at the table if I was having a conversation about this. Studio 222 is also something that's been around for quite some time. It's an after school program that serves underprivileged kids. And they uh, actually work specifically with a couple schools. They have transportation, they go and they, they pick the kids up from school. They bring them um, to, it's uh, funded through and provided through St. Luke's. And they provide them a hot meal. And uh, four days a week they do art instruction. And then the fifth day they do some type of field trip out into the city. And um, Studio 222, in my opinion, is somebody that has, is really, has sustained some uh, really incredible effect. Oklahoma City Girls Art School is, is, is unique in that they take young girls and they, what they want to do is they want to stay, they want to be like a faithful presence in these kids' girls, uh, these girls' lives.
lives throughout their kind of time in the Oklahoma City public school system. So they will take them when they're young and the goal is to stay with them until they graduate. And um, they are going all over the city and they're doing things with artists and then they're making art and, and they're doing an incredible job of what they're doing there. One of the things that, um, and then we have people like Amber Sharples and Julia Kurt, um, Oklahoma Arts Council and the Oklahomans for the Arts who are have been working in these areas for ever and um, and doing a- excellent excellent job making great progress in all these areas there's one newer um, group that I think is interesting because to me I can look at what they're doing and I could I can kind of say it's not out of reach to make an effect it's actually seems pretty like it, it's doable. So there's a um, an organization, a, a space in Oklahoma City called Current, Current Studio, and it is a newer space, and it's run by two women who are really close friends of mine, and um, they do a lot of things to just promote community uh, through art. And one of the things that they are doing right now is because they're in the class and ten pen area, they are. Um, focusing on Eugene Fields and Eugene Fields had some cuts this year and so it's just these two women that were like how can we serve the school as artists and so they are in the process of raising $15,000 and that money will fund teachers and art for a complete semester for that school and it um, and and it's it seems like as little administrative process like these two women are like we're going to raise some money we've got four artists these artists are going to spend a month in the school working with the kids and every student in the school will be touched by that for fifteen thousand dollars and uh, and some people that are on board with it and um so those are i just wanted to highlight some of the things that i felt like were people were doing really really well i think there is tremendous opportunity for um salt uh, and other people to make a make an impact in this place. In my personal opinion, um, the easiest point of contact for in the life of a child is through arts education, and um, and in my estimation, a group taking a school and putting the resources into one school at a time is a way to make a really um, direct, tangible influence in the lives of our children. That is all I have to share for right now.